Hey Health Junkies, it's time for The Health Fix. Join your host doctor, Janine Krause, as she gives you a dose of what you need to know and do right now to take control of your health from the inside out to rebel against aging, look damn good, fight stress, and laugh every day. Hey Health Junkies, Dr. Kira Barr from the Resilient Health Institute stopped by my office for an interview and we decided to dish on her favorite subject, the skin. So let me give you a little background information on here before we get into the podcast. Dr. Kira Barr is a dermatologist who has extensive training in skin cancer and research, but realized there's more to skin than what you see on the surface. She now focuses on the lifestyle factors, hormonal imbalances, the diet and emotional factors that relate to skin health. To increase her reach, she took her specialty online and now speaks all over the country on skin health and focuses on helping patients address their skin from the inside out via telemedicine at the Resilient Health Institute. Now that you have a little background on Kira, it's time to listen to our interview. Hello there, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krauss, and today I have a treat for you. I have Dr. Kira Barr with me. She is a dermatologist, and she is the head chick in charge over at Resilient Health Institute here in Gig Harbor, Washington. So, and pretty much all over the world, since it is <laughs> online and it's telemedicine um, at its best. But you guys are in, in for a great, great show, because what we're going to do is we're just going to talk about skincare. We're going to talk about preventing skin cancer. We're going to talk about some of the myths out there and kind of dive into some of the questions that I get commonly from my patients. I think the number one thing here is all about how much sun, do you need sunblock, all those different things. So I'm not going to just drill you right off the bat. Say hello. <laughs> hello, everybody. <laughs> so in terms of skin care philosophy, mm-hmm. if you were told to give people one thing and that's all you could ever do just to keep their skin healthy, what would you do? Not it would not be sunscreen. All right. <laughs> See? It Myth would not word. be sunscreen. Um, uh, it would be good sleep. Mm-hmm. That would be the one thing that I would give people if I could gift people the gift of sleep. Oh my goodness. That's why I need to figure out how to have the sleeping pods in the office. I've seen some cool stuff. Have you seen that out there I where people not. are paying to to get in a room in a spa where it's all like outfitted with Casper beds and they've got pajamas and everything oh, and they nice. can just take a nap in there for like $25 for an hour. Oh wow. Well, it, well it's funny because I just, um, that's the blog post that I just wrote about sleep is basically making your bedroom like the most long luxurious spa that you've ever been to and why do you love a spa right because it appeals to all your five senses and that is really what your bedroom should be right it should be uh, your cozy cave where it appeals to all your five senses you can truly rest and and relax so um, I think one of the biggest things is when we go to bed like we really want to generate melatonin and not just because well one, because it is one of the most potent antioxidants that our body can produce. Um, but recent studies have shown the value, the the role that melatonin can play in skin cancer prevention and management, especially with regards to melanoma. So getting good sleep is so, so important. I think that's huge that you mentioned that because I think that was like the number one thing that folks were not expecting to right. come out of your mouth. <laughs> And it's also the number one thing that I find in my practice people struggle with. Mm -hmm. Because I can imagine if I go into people's bedrooms, there might be clothes piled everywhere. There might be stuff piled everywhere. I just know from friends, we walk in and I'm like, oh my gosh, what are you guys doing in here? Is this like your storage closet? Right. And so how can you even sleep in chaos like that? Yeah. And I I think one of the biggest things, so, so in order to generate melatonin, right, it has to be dark. Mm -hmm. Um, So the number one thing I would recommend that people like never do in their bedroom is have a TV. Yeah. So, I mean, it's so tempting. You want to be comfortable and watch your favorite movie, Netflix or what have you, but it actually could be incredibly detrimental to the quality of your sleep. So um, your bedroom should just be for maybe reading um, before bedtime. And I always do it with a salt lamp. So I have that kind of ambient amber light Um, and for good loving. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. Um, And so uh, you really want to create an environment that is that that is 
dark. So having blackout curtains, um, all the little lights uh, in your room, like the outlets and such. Um, I don't know any other company that hasn't, but I'm sure that they do. But like True Dark, mm -hmm. that makes um, Dave Astry's company True Dark. Uh, he has the blue blocker glasses, which are great, but he also has little stickers that you can put over all the little um, lights in your room on the outlets and such. So making your room completely dark is really um, key. And then, um, so that's sight. So sound, you know, there are certain sounds that lull us to bed, but there's some that completely disrupt. So as best you can. Um, if you need to use a sound machine, or uh, I look really sexy at night, I wear a mask <laughs> and earplugs, and I do need to go get um, uh, my mouth guard because I, I have a tendency to, to clench my teeth. So my husband, he's a, he's one lucky guy. <laughs> How attractive I look before I go to bed. Um, but then scent also, your sense of smell. So again, there are smells that are very uh, pleasant, and then there are those that aren't. So having an air filter, so to purify your air, and I I don't know if you have a favorite brand or not. I have um, Air Doctor uh, air filters uh, in every room of our home and um, aromatherapy. So a diffuser um, by your bedside. Uh, there are different blends that are very helpful. Lavender is notoriously known to um, be good for relaxation um, and touch, right? So making sure you have bedding that is cozy, comfortable, and um, maintaining an optimal temperature in your room of like 65 to 75 degrees. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we are having some amazing nights. You can open <laughs> up your, your window, but um, if you don't live where we live, uh, you could use a fan. Or one of my favorite things um, is the chili pad. Have you oh. heard of the chili pad? Yeah. So this is this great device, and I have no uh, interest in them at all. I'm just, uh, I'm just a huge fan. Um, it's like a huge... Um, pad that you put on your bed and um, we have a king size bed so my husband has his, it's almost like the sleep number thing, like he's got his pad, I've got my pad and it does uh, cooling as well as heating. I'm writing that down because yeah, yeah, I is, did not know about this chili pad. So you can set your temp and I set mine, um, you know, so the optimal temp is supposed to be 65 to 75 degrees in your bedroom my, my ideal temp is anywhere from like 71 to 73 degrees and I'm in my mid 40s now and uh, some changes are happening with my hormones. When I don't use that pad, I have woken up sweating before. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm having a hot flash. I have to, you know, uh, maybe I've eaten too close to bed. My body's having to work really hard. When I use the pad, nothing. I sleep wow. so much more soundly. So, um, yeah, creating that right environment is so key to getting good night's sleep. That's huge. That's huge because I talked to probably maybe my last podcast. I can't remember if it was podcast 99. This is podcast 100, by the way. Oh, yay, <laughs> so exciting. This is a big one. <laughs> this is a big one. And so I think in my last one, I was talking all about resetting your circadian rhythms. Mm -hmm. And melatonin is part of the circadian rhythm. And right. it makes a lot of sense as to why we will end up, if we're not getting enough melatonin production, why we end up with issues with sleep and wake cycles, but also right. skin hormone regulation. And going back to the chili pad in the hormone, hormones i have found that if i can get people to sleep better and sleep more comfortably mm -hmm. hot flashes go away and they don't yeah. need all the hormone creams right so right it's shocking well when we don't sleep well right um cortisol goes up mm -hmm. melatonin goes down well when your cortisol goes up guess what else goes down all your other hormones <laughs> the estrogen the pressure i mean everything just gets out of balance and then your leptin and your ghrelin, so like your waistline, you know, <laughs> you know, weight issues become a problem too. So getting good sleep is kind of at the foundation of so many health issues. But I don't think that people appreciate the true intersection. So I was reading statistics, I think like 60 million people uh, have chronic like sleep issues. Mm -hmm. um, and 80 million people go to their doctor for skin problems. So wow. it outranks like anxiety, depression. I mean, so the intersection between sleep disorders and skin disorders is huge. And, um, you know, just looking in the scientific literature with uh, regards to the impact of sleep, not just on, you know, fine lines and wrinkles, right? So why does that happen? You know, when your cortisol, if you're not sleeping, Cortisol goes up, melatonin goes down. Well, cortisol is going to um, be more than happy to, um, you know, 
contribute to breakdown of your collagen and your elastin, which are the supportive tissue in your skin. So fine lines and wrinkles. Um, and um, so anyway, yes, yeah, sleep is so, 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 so important. So I had another question about sleep, yeah, yeah. because this is another big debate that always happens in my office, because I'm almost fighting or, like, pleading, or maybe there's this, like, deal we make between myself and my patients. Like, what do you think about the blue light, so the screen, so mm-hmm. the iPad, the the phone? We always talk, like, I'm trying to get people off of this two mm-hmm. hours before bed, but I can usually only get people to agree to one hour before bed. Right. What's your take on that? So I think that it is a huge problem. Um, and I am totally guilty of, I'm like, just one more thing. Okay, just one more thing. And I want to shut it off at two hours, and, I, and it, sometimes it's, like, up until the last minute. But what I've done to kind of work around that, which is not new news, um, you know, you add filters to mm-hmm. your products, like um, the Flux, like just get flux.com. It's a free download that you can um, put on your iPhone or your iPad or any device that you have and what that does is it takes the brightness down based on like almost like the, the time of day so it's a sunset so it's funny I'm studying for my um, recertification for my derm path board so it's it's microscopic images where I need to see the color in it and at a certain time my flux like it, it kicks in and I'm like what the color I can't, I'm like, I can't see it so I'm thankful it actually works um, so, so that's an easy thing that you can, that you can do. And the second is wearing those blue blocking glasses. And so, um, I've, we have them stashed all over the house. And so when the kids, um, you know, are watching TV, everyone, there's a pile. Unfortunately, most of them wind up in, in my drawer <laughs> because I forget where I put them. And, and then I take another pair. And, um, but those are two easy things, you know, wearing the blue blocking glasses and, um, the filters on your device so that, um, you know, this is real life. Like, we can only do so much. You've got to get the work done. You've got deadlines. But you can create a little bit of a buffer so it doesn't disrupt your sleep as much. Because mm-hmm. that is a big thing. You know, a lot of people are like, well, why do I really need, you know, to, to block the blue light? Well, why do I need, to, you know, less screen time? Well, because of melatonin. That's exactly. That's the big kicker here. Everybody, melatonin. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. magical. Yeah. Magical stuff, you want lots of it, or right. at least to sleep. Then right. you want it to go away to wake up in the morning. Right. And that's, um, you know, the whole um, discussion about oral supplementation versus, you know, and some people don't do well. I mean, melatonin isn't necessarily the supplement that you should be taking, right? Because some people get groggy from it. The goal is mm-hmm. to generate your own. As we get older, certainly the pineal gland, which is um, that the gland that produces melatonin, production does diminish as we age and so the other the the supplement that most of us should be taking is magnesium Mm -hmm. before bed about an hour before bed and there's some really interesting studies i think especially for women um taking an hour before bed that women fell asleep faster stayed asleep longer i don't know if they woke up you know more refreshed but i forget what the rest of the study was um but I mean, I, I know for sure, for me, it, it is it, that is the case. That combined, if you combine magnesium with L-theanine, mm-hmm. right? So there are different formulations of magnesium, but um, magnesium with L-theanine, which really contributes to relaxation. I mean, talk about a nice way to wind down um, for what's for sleep. And so, you know, these things aren't expensive, right? No. These things aren't complicated. It's and it's and it's and it's not one thing, right? It's it's kind of a culmination of things. So if you start like like twelve steps to better sleep, if you do one thing a month, I mean, I know no one really wants to wait a full year to be sleeping better, but if it's just you know if habits are hard to begin, like or maybe twelve weeks, <laughs> right. once up a week, like just a little bit by a little bit, um, you really can. Um, sorry, this dog bowl. <laughs> We're in my um, office. The dog bulls are everywhere. Um, I mean, it, it really can make a huge impact. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I think I think it, it, you made a really good point there, a couple of different things. One, habits, because mm-hmm. really this is about habits. I feel like my job is really to teach people new habits. I don't think mm-hmm. – I, I don't even consider myself a doctor some days. I'm, like, master of teaching you habits um, and mm-hmm. trying to get new things going one step at a time. Mm-hmm. The magnesium, a lot of people ask me, what's the best magnesium? What do yes. you find as the best one in your, in your well, research? Well, I guess the, with- the- um, I know I'm, I'm always um, questioning this, but my, the glycinate mm-hmm. um, for sleep versus um, is it? I'm going to be 
chelate, like the cis- citrate, citrate, or citrate chelate. chelate for more of like the muscle discomfort and, and cramping, things like that. So I go with the glycinate formulation for nighttime. I do too. I like glycinate. I kind of go magnesium glycinate good and magnesium citrate C for crap because it makes you poop. poop. So I, I like try to Which do is these very letters. important too. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, in the scheme of things for skin, where where would we put pooping on that scale? Like if sleep's number one, where does pooping fall into that department? Where would we, we throw well, that? Well, in terms, of, I mean, pooping is showing that your body's functioning and kind of clearing out, detoxing, all that good stuff. So I would I would put it up there. It means that your system is functioning. Like, okay. Gut health, Mm -hmm. right? Gut health is so important to skin health. I mean, um, the brain-gut-skin connection is significant. So I would say pooping has to be right up there with sleep. Yep, and I would I would a hundred percent agree on that. If folks aren't pooping and they've got acne or we've got you know really congestive pores, yes, psoriasis, eczema, all of that stuff for sure. I'm going to be definitely working on that. And then Mm -hmm. of course hydration. Mm -hmm. What do you think, pooping first or hydration? Just for just for the sake of I feel debate. Like, I mean, can, can you really have one without the other? Because if you're not hydrating, you're gonna have was the first you're gonna have those little nuggets. You're gonna have ones like you're not gonna be pooping very well. So you need to hydrate in order to poop. Yes. So one goes hand in hand with the other. So you gotta have the water so you don't get the rabbit pellets. Mm-hmm. Very important stuff here. <laughs> right. You guys are learning earth shattering information <laughs> here. So, ah. so tell me this, because we, we go debates all the time in my office, but we also talked about it just the other day. I was at a skin conference, um, and we were talking about how folks in Seattle and Minnesota, like the higher rates of melanoma, mm-hmm. because I think a lot of people have this idea that if the sun isn't out, you don't need sunscreen. Mm-hmm. Let's debate on that a little bit. Yeah. So what's your yeah. thought? My thought is the sun is always out. Mm-hmm. And it is true that depending on your latitude and longitude and time of year, you, the um, ultraviolet B rays, they will fluctuate. The intensity will fluctuate. And those are the rays that cause the burn, um, typically. UVA can contribute. Now, UVA rays are the same consistent intensity all year round. And those are the rays that um, can penetrate deeper into the skin. Those are the ones that damage your uh, collagen and elastin, really contribute to your aging. They're called the aging rays. Um, Together, UVA and UVB both contribute to skin cancer. So um, the sun is out all the time, 365. Yes, the UVB rays may fluctuate in intensity, but they're still there. They're still causing damage. So you got to protect yourself all year round. So what is your opinion then, if we need to protect ourselves all year round, do you, where do you stand on the physical versus chemical sunscreens? What's, physical only. There you go. <laughs> um, no, that being said, no, no, this is, um, I'm, I'm a little bit biased uh, because the science will say that the chemical sunscreens provide a very good protection, um, a great UVA coverage, and we do not have a good standard. Um, like SPF factor is sun protection factor, and it's really only corresponding to the UVB rays. We don't have uh, a scale for UVA. Um, why I don't uh, promote the chemical sunscreens, um, for personal reasons too, is that they irritate your skin. Mm-hmm. And uh, like the avobenzones, the parcel 1789s, um, they are one of the biggest culprits of allergic contact dermatitis. Mm. So when people say I'm allergic to sunscreen, yeah, they, they, they might be because um, it could be the active ingredient in the sunscreen. It also could be some preservatives or fragrances. But, um, but the chemical sunscreens are notorious for causing skin irritation. And when the, the way that they work is that they're absorbed into the skin and it creates a chemical chemical reaction essentially. So if you've ever put sunscreen on and your skin feels a little bit warm or a little burning, that's that chemical reaction taking place and that is also why you're encouraged to wear your sunscreen. Put it on 20 minutes before you go out in the sun. So it has time to kind of activate, so to speak. Your physical blockers like your zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, well, they basically form just a, a, a create a coating on the surface. So essentially, the light kind of bounces off of it, and so um, very non-irritating. It's safe to use in your littles as well as adults, um, and so that's another thing I'd love to point out to save everyone a few pennies. You're in the 
companies out there are probably not going to be very happy with me. But um, nobody sponsors this, <laughs> so <laughs> there's no right, sponsorship so when whatsoever. To, when you go to the store and you see um, sunscreen on the shelf and it says "baby" and just like regular, just know that that is marketing. There is hmm. really no formulation difference, especially if you're looking. I mean, read your labels. I always encourage everyone: read your food labels, read your personal care labels. Definitely read your sunscreen labels, just to make sure that there's nothing that you have sensitivity to. But by you know, far for the most part, they are the same product, and hmm. they're just marketing it uh, in a different package. But your zinc oxide, you know, your 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 physical sun blockers, safe to use for the entire family. Now, depending on how many people are in your family and how the, the how tall and big <laughs> they are, uh, you may need a few bottles of sunscreen, right? And I think that's important, and we can get into why that why that is. Um, because, yeah, I want to know. Yeah. Do tell. Do tell. You've opened that door. I've we got to go. <laughs> so, so um, you know, for babies six months and under, we don't recommend sunscreen, mostly because uh, kids' um, body surface area is actually greater. Than, than in adults, and so in terms of absorption and, and minimizing uh, exposure and chemicals and such, so recommend just kind of shielding the baby with um, protective clothing or keeping them in the shade. But for your toddlers on up, um, well, you want to just, uh, inter- we don't have the exact uh, amount for like your kids, you just want to cover them, but for an adult, let's say, you need um, an ounce, a full ounce, or the equivalent of a shot glass. Wow! Um, for your whole body, if you're wearing, you know, your little cute bathing suit outside, um, most people, and so that means uh, that's just for your body. For your face, it's it's like half teaspoon. It's like um, like a nickel size amount. You need to put it on, and and twenty five to fifty percent of people do not apply that amount. So yeah. let's just say you and I and our significant others go to the beach, and it's a four ounce bottle of sunscreen that we've picked up at Target, and um, we're sharing it, and we each want to a- apply our serving that tube of sunscreen. If we each use our ounce, that tube of sunscreen should go in the garbage. Wow, we're done with it. And if we're at that beach for two hours, we're going to need to reapply it. So guess what? We need to have a second bottle of sunscreen in our bag to reapply. And then that one should go in the garbage because if we fully reapplied our ounces, um, we would have used up that second bottle. Wow. And most people have the same bottle in their purse or beach for bag. Years. For <laughs> Hopefully not for years, but at least, you know, throughout the summer uh, and maybe into the next season. So, wow. Yeah, so people are just are not using it enough. Um which is why number 1 sunscreen should be your last line of defense, not your first, although I do believe it should absolutely be part of your sun protection um, armamentarium. And two, uh why I think it's um bunk that people are saying that sunscreen is the cause of the increase in the skin cancer ep- epidemic. Because no sunscreen can block 100% of the UVB rays. You're still getting exposure. Uh, Number two, statistics show that a quarter to 50% of the people aren't even using it properly. So you're getting a lot more exposure. So um, there's a lot more to it than that. So I think that wearing uh, sunscreen in your moisturizer every day should be like brushing your teeth. Um, Just part of your daily routine. But that's really your icing on the cake. You got to be getting good sleep. You got to be eating um, a nutrient dense whole foods diet. You know, full of phytonutrients, um, and uh, enjoy your treats, but as much out of a box <laughs> as possible. And if you're eating out of a box, uh, read those ingredients. So hopefully, it's five ingredients or less. Um, yeah. So there's there's a lot more that goes into it. Absolutely, because I think one of the things people forget about, yeah, you could slather on a whole bunch of sunscreen, but if you're eating crap and you're not getting in any of the phytonutrients, you have no internal protection, antioxidant protection to help right. you with things that go awry when, it, when you are exposed to too much exactly. of UVA, UVV, UBV. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> 
Right. Yes, yeah, it is so true. So, um, you know, we have our own innate um, reserve of antioxidants and when we're exposed to environmental stressors like the sun, air pollution, um, you know, physical stressors and such, that reserve is de- depleted, quickly depleted because it, it, your body's doing the best that it can to to use those antioxidants to help um, uh, prevent damage. Um, and so you need to replenish those supplies and that's where your diet comes into play. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, yes, there's serums, right? But I have a lot of people that are like, well, I'll just use my antioxidant serum and I'm all good. I don't have to eat healthy. And I'm well, like, how many you know. how many chemicals and, and other things are in those serums that you're then absorbing that your antioxidant reserve needs to then deal with as well? So, yeah. you, so I mean, it's it, there are some skincare products out there that are phenomenal, but those alone are not enough. Right, you got it's got to be from an inside out job, mm-hmm. and then outside in, and then the two together, you're gonna get your maximum benefit. Make a note, everyone, <laughs> because I get so many ladies coming in, and they're like, "I've got my antioxidant serum, and I've got my super vitamin C serum, which is an antioxidant serum, right. and then I mean they've got all of these layers upon layers of stuff." But then you're like, "Okay, what'd you have for breakfast?" And then the the story unfolds, yeah. and it's just like, "Oh my goodness, you can't rely on these hundred dollar plus bottles of serums to save you." Well, that's that's the thing. These products are not like the good. They're great quality products, and they're not inexpensive. And you have like cabinets where women are like, "I've got spent thousands of dollars on products and procedures, and their results aren't lasting." And so, if you want to maximize, and listen, I'm I'm like I said, I'm in my mid forties now. I am not poo pooing uh, aesthetic <laughs> procedures. Um, they have a place. But to get the most bang for your buck, it is really focusing on your lifestyle factor so that all these other things that you want to spend your money on, they really have the impact that you want. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Absolutely. So that's money well spent. Absolutely. And I think it's, you know, something to think about in terms of prevention because some of the things that my mother never told me, Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggies was when I was in my 20s that my skin was already starting to age. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, she passed away when I was about 26, and so we only got six years of telling me what to do with my skin, Mm -hmm. but... You know, I think a lot of folks don't even realize that in their 20s, they need to be thinking about sleep. You Mm -hmm. know, 20s is right, the party years, right? Right. And maybe if we're, you know, going to medical school, pulling all minors to study. And so what did that do for our skin? Mm -hmm. What about shift workers and folks that, you know, some nurses that I know will work, you know, a couple days on, a couple days off, and they go from mornings, you know, days, sometimes to nights, sometimes. Mm -hmm. What do you see with skin in that case? So uh, not just skin, but how, like chronic disease and diabetes and weight. I mean, just because their your rhythms are so off. So yeah, I mean, and on top of that, because of the shift work um, and the odd hours, how many nurses and medical professionals who work nights smoke? Mm-hmm. So the damage that that's doing to your collagen and your elastin. I mean, um, so your hormones are just totally wackadoodle. So yeah. Um, uh, you see a lot of kind of like dull complexion, acne breakouts. Um, uh, yeah, I think it, I think it can make quite a difference. Now, granted, if shift work is is your thing and and you can't change it, that's okay. So when you have the opportunity to sleep, you want to maximize the quality of the sleep you're getting. So again, that's why it's so important um, to make your bedroom like that high end spa. Like even if you get home in the morning and make your room dark get those blackout curtains and wear the eye mask and and make your environment conducive to getting quality sleep i i absolutely agree i absolutely agree and my other additive to that is always cleaning and organizing and minimizing what you have in your bedroom because i have this thought that Mm -hmm. all of the subconscious of like the stuff that's sitting on your dresser and the stuff that's under your bed do affect what's going on in your mind when you try to sleep I'm a woo naturopath here, but Mm -hmm. I do think that it has something to do with the overall ability. And to add on to that, I mean, physical clutter is one thing, um, and uh, wholeheartedly, it stresses me out. Um, But also the mental clutter. Mm -hmm. The mental clutter will also keep you from sleeping well. So I encourage people, um, when their mind is racing, you know, have like a dump journal uh, Mm -hmm. next to your bed, or if you have your phone, which you should put in airplane mode if it's next to your bed, so you're kind of decreasing the amount of um, transmission of EMF and stuff. Um, But just even just uh, put a voice memo 
just get it out, just like purge it so that it's not spinning in your mind. So the physical clutter and, and the mental clutter, just try and get rid of it, get it out of your your head and out of your room. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. I think yeah. all of it, you know, put together. So now I'm going to let you guys on in on a little background on Dr. Kira here. She has a lot of background in research uh, in terms of melanoma in particular. And so I wanted her to talk a little bit about melanoma because I think a lot of people um, will see a mole on their skin and start freaking out like, oh my God, I have melanoma. I'm going to die. And and a lot of patients of mine, of course, we're always going to go and get that checked out. But I think that we need to back up and, and go back to, yes, sleep being part of this, but also talking about what you've seen over the years and, you know, ways people can, in addition to sleep, help to work with preventing melanoma, but also mm-hmm. things they need to know should they have it. Because I just had a really great friend of mine um, diagnosed and then she had her her melanoma removed and now she's like, okay, I've been giving nothing in terms of I should eat a certain way or I should do this or I should do that to keep this melanoma away and, and prevent myself from having any more. Mm-hmm. And she's now paranoid that every single mole in her body is going to turn into melanoma. Yeah. So that was a hefty mm-hmm. statement I made there. So Yeah, yeah. and um, it's not uncommon. And, um, you know, I speak not just from professional experience, having done melanoma fellowship and, and skin cancer being you know, a big part of uh, the practice that I had, um, but myself personally being diagnosed, having to diagnose myself um, with melanoma. So thankfully, I knew what to look for. I caught it early, um, but that's the key. you got to be looking. And so the biggest piece of advice I have for people is, and you can have fun with this, right? Mm-hmm. I tell everyone is to, you know, get naked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and people are like, uh, what? It's like, yes, well, you're going to get naked anyway. Um, but you pick one day a month, and ideally it's the date of your birthday because you never forget it. You always know the date of your birthday, and you pick the same date every month, and you check your birthday suit for any uninvited guests, right? <laughs> so what you're looking for, you know, if you get familiar with your skin, you're checking yourself over head to toe, and this is where you can have some fun with it. You get your significant other to check the parts that you can't see. Mm-hmm. Um and, and you are looking for spots that stand out from your crowd, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone, it's, it's pattern recognition. This isn't, you don't have to be a dermatologist to, to, have, to, to, to be able to do this. You're looking for patterns. So um, we always talk about uh, something called like a signature nevus. Like you have a mole and a lot of your moles look the same way. Like let's just say for mine, for instance, I've got um, brown moles with like a little dot at the periphery. Well, that's my signature and I've got a lot of them. Had I only had one and everyone else didn't have a dot, well then the one with the dot is the one I'd be looking for. But because that's my normal, I'm good with it. I'm looking for that pattern. So now I'm looking for something that stands out from that crowd and that's your ugly duckling. So that's that's number one. But... Um, And that's the same for sores that aren't healing. So a lot of people will come in, they've got something on their face, and they're like, yeah, I have this zit, and just won't go away. It's been there for like six months. I'm like, okay, that might not, that's likely not a zit because a pimple doesn't last for six months. Doesn't mean it's a skin cancer because there's lots of other benign uh, neoplasms, that growths, that, um, that can occur that are not skin cancer. But the only way to know that is either using a dermoscopy or, or biopsying it. But when it comes to um, moles and melanoma, what you are looking for, or what we call the ABCDEs, right? Yes. Um, and so knowing your alphabet, you know, kind of going back to like basics. Um, so A stands for asymmetry. And so if you have a spot on your um, body, and if you were to cut it down the middle, if it's not the same on both sides, it's asymmetric, okay? So that's one you want to make note of and bring to your doctor. Um, B is for border. So we want any spot you have to have a nice, crisp, clear, well-demarcated border. Spots that have like little legs, little blurriness to it, we don't like that. We don't like that. It doesn't mean that it's inherently bad. It just means it's one to be mindful of. Show that one to your doctor. C is for color. We like things that are uniform in color. Um, So melanomas can be what we call amelanotic, and those uh, are more pink in color. They can be really dark in color, like black, or they can have multiple colors within them. So again, it's kind of you're looking for the one that stands out from the crowd. 
So any spot that you have that is a different color than all your other spots or one that has variation in color in it, that's another one to show to your dermatologist. D is for diameter. And this is a really soft call. So we used to say it's, it's something smaller than five millimeters or uh, the size of a pencil eraser, but I can assure you I've seen melanomas that are pinpoint, like they're tiny. So very soft call. E is probably the most important, and that is for evolving, a spot that is changing over time, which is why it's so important that every single month you set that date <laughs> with yourself and you check your birthday suit because you want to see if something is changing. Changing means that changes are happening. DNA is, you know, <laughs> it, it, something's going something's on. Something's going it. on. Um, and again, doesn't automatically mean it's a bad something, but it's something that should be checked. So yeah, your A, B, C, D, E's. Uh, so when you when you are looking, so um, you want to look for things that are asymmetric, uh, uh, irregular in border, variation in color. Um, in terms of size, just something that maybe is a lot bigger, you know, just out of um, keeping with all your other spots, and E is something that is changing over time. Uh, again, a sore that isn't healing. Um, itching. Itching is one that it's a soft call, but um, a spot that is persistently itchy. It's not a mosquito bite, but it's persistently itchy. Keep an eye on that one because there, it's really interesting. Um, uh, we've had, I've had a bunch of patients with their melanoma just start, started itching. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of growth. There's uh, new blood vessels coming. There's like, you know, receptors. And yeah. so um, so just something to be mindful of. Yeah. Now, what about pain? Because most of my patients will come and be like, well, don't you think it would hurt? And I'm like, I don't think so. Not in terms of what I've learned. Mm -mm. So itching. Pain is not um, typically uh, a complaint that most people have. Yeah. Okay. Good yeah. to know. Because, yeah, I was saying that going, well, I didn't learn it, so I need to I need to check with right. the professional on that right. one. Right. But itching is definitely something I've seen over time, too. Mm -hmm. Like, someone's like, gosh, you know, it just itches right here, and I can't seem to make it stop. And I'm like, well, look at that mole you got there. We should get that looked at. Right, right. And so um, things that itch, too, I mean, there are things called separate keratosis, which are benign thickenings at the top layer of the skin that can look very similar to a mole, and those can itch because they because it's thickening of the top layer, it gets, and it loves to be in, like, the most inconvenient places, like around your bra line or on your, like, um, underwear line or something like that. And so those things can itch. So, again, it's always important to, to have a second set of eyes on it. And that's the other thing. Recruit everybody that you know, your hairdresser, to look in your scalp because melanoma can occur in the scalp. Have your ophthalmologist or your optometrist look in your eye because ocular melanoma is incredibly challenging to treat so you want to make sure that you're getting your eyes checked uh, your dentist melanoma can occur in the mouth your um, OBGYN uh, melanoma can occur in the genitalia so that being said um, your external uh, genitalia get a mirror get familiar check all your your nooks and crannies um, and all your intimate bits there's it's skin there's, this is nothing to be bashful about. Just check it. And then in between your toes, bottoms of your feet. And for ladies, you know, who keep their nails, toenails and fingernails painted all the time, um, between color changes, look at your nails to make sure there's no um, pigmented areas because melanoma can occur underneath the fingernails Ooh. and the toenails. I had no idea about that. Mm -hmm. That's a biggie. So ladies, yeah. Because I think there's some ladies who never see what their natural nails ever even look like. Right. Ever. Right. Hmm. Yeah. So just, you know, just take a take take a quick peek between color changes. Yeah. No, that's huge. And between the toes, I think that's important too. Mm -hmm. See, now we have games for you to play before bed. You that's don't right. need your screens. <laughs> this is like going to be amazing for people. And have fun with it. Yeah, you're naked. You know, yeah. like just make just make it part of your routine. Um, you know, you check your partner's back. They check yours. Like, it's just, it, it could be a family affair. Everyone checks each other, keeps an eye out for each other because um, I tell you what, just like, you know, doing breast exams, like you, so many of the cancers are found by the individuals themselves. Mm -hmm. You know your body better than anybody else. So here's another um, a piece of um, encouragement is um, be your own advocate. Like for me, when um, there are two reasons why I would remove something, it bothers me or it bothers 
the individual. And if it bothers them more than it bothers me, well, it's still going to come off. If I, unless I, it's flat, I was like, it's it's something so benign, like it's just, um, <laughs> and I know it won't be covered by insurance or what have you, and it's just unnecessary. But um, melanoma is a humbling, humbling disease. Like I can't even tell you, uh, and, and stories that I've heard. Ah, my, you know, it's, it's nothing. Oh my gosh. It was a thick melanoma, you know, like you just don't want to mess with it. If, if there's any concern, just check it. Because I have, I mean, that's absolutely great advice because I've heard that if they're pretty deep, now we have some serious surgery coming up mm-hmm. and now some disfigurement I've even heard from some of the severe, more severe cases. Right. right. So, uh, so the way to deal with melanoma um, uh, is we excise it and you go down to you know you've got three layers of of uh, skin you've got your epidermis your top layer your dermis your middle layer then your fat layer and then your fascia and, and your muscle so a wide local excision to get the melanoma out depending on how thick it is like they go down to the fat like the fascia like it is a full thickness removal and um, we take a, a centimeter to two around um, the lesion. So it can be a significant chunk of skin. And then on top of that, depending on how thick it is, uh, we are concerned about spread to metastasis and spread to lymph nodes. So then we might need to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy, which I know is a controversial um, topic if people believe in that <laughs> or not in, in all the um, academic institutions. And then, um, you know, treatment like the um, biologics, immunotherapy, IL-2 and stuff. So, so you want to catch things early. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah. let's talk about that a little bit in terms of treatment for melanoma, because I think a lot of people have, like, they think it gets cut out, and then you were just mentioning biologics, but yeah, a lot of people think, oh, it's cut out, it's good, we're done. And so no need to really worry about it. if I get melanoma, no biggie, life goes on. I mean, I've heard that before in my practice yeah. over and over again. Yeah, and I think... Um, hopefully not as much with melanoma, but with your squamous cells and your basal, basal cells. I think I don't know if people appreciate that uh, skin cancer is the most prevalent cancer in the United States right now, that one in five people will be diagnosed with skin cancer, that there are more new cases of skin cancer diagnosed each year than breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, all other cancers combined. Hmm. I don't think people appreciate how significant a problem skin cancer is because... It is like, I just cut it out and forget about it. Right. right? I mean, that's the attitude, right. honestly. That is the attitude. And thankfully, basal cell carcinoma, which is the most common type of skin cancer, um, it is, you know, with with treatment, um, the cure rate is really quite high, and the risk of metastasis is like 0.0028% Like, it's less than 1%. Um, and, but, but the problem is most people don't just get one. Right, it's like they, they get one. The clocks are ticking. They're not taking measures to continue to prevent their skin, so they wind up with multiple skin cancers. Squamous cell, again, a non melanoma type of skin cancer. Um, it can be a little bit more aggressive, um, but again, the treatment is cutting it out, or um, sometimes we have to use radiation and other things. But melanoma is the most deadly type of skin cancer, and so yes, when it's a thin melanoma, we can excise it. But there's always the concern, like, did one cell get, get out? Yeah. And so, forth. Um, and so when a melanoma is thicker than um, a millimeter or underneath the microscope, it has some features that um, there's a whole uh, category. If it's ulcerated or what have you, it's higher risk for, for uh, metastasis. And so there are treatments like um, uh, immunotherapy that are being used and um, the improvements in um, it's not even quantity it's like a, the, the quality of life it's hard I mean it's it, they're beneficial treatments but they all have side effects and they all have consequences and um, we're a lot further ahead than we were uh, a decade ago but um, I really don't want that for anybody. So please, please, please just check your skin. Get checked early. <laughs> when in doubt, check it out. Um, yeah. 
Absolutely. Now you definitely got my mind going a lot more about it because I used to joke. I fully admit, and I know I've said on the podcast, like I love the sun. You know, if I'm going to get one cancer, it's going to be skin cancer, which I joke about it, but no, I really don't want it. Um, But if you do, but if you do, you want basal cell, right? I I always joke about that too with patients. Like, I mean, listen, uh, you should love the sun. We need the sun. It is so vital. It is that feel good vitamin that we need every single day. I mean, I shared the story with you. Like when we moved here, like I had a move, we moved houses. Like I, I literally seasonal affective disorder is real. Like the sun does not shine here. I needed to see, you know, I, I I needed to see brightness. I had to see the water, at least the, the cloud, like the cloud cover, like the, the light reflecting off the water. I mean, you need to get out, but, and you shouldn't be afraid of it. You just have to be mindful so you can get the benefit without the burn. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And making sure you're putting, you know, don't fall into that 15 minutes in the sun, no sunblock kind of, I keep hearing it over and over again that you, you can't get the benefit from the sun if you don't have your sunblock on. And I'm like, you know what? I think you get a benefit from the sun if your eyes see the sun and it hit, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it's... Right now, the sun, natural light's coming in the office, and I'm, like, happy. It's great. Mm -hmm. You know, if it gets cloudy, then there's definitely that that feeling. Mm -hmm. And we need it for our circadian rhythms, too. We absolutely do. We absolutely do. And I know we talked a little bit about that vitamin D research Mm -hmm. that's starting to come out. So we we do not have the background on this yet, just full disclosure to everyone out there. But there is some research coming out saying that vitamin D might not be um, as beneficial as we once thought. Yeah. But sun is still good. Sun is still good. Well, in terms of supplementation, so vitamin D that, you know, your the UVB, your your skin, um, UVB rays hit your skin, uh, biochemical transformation, you know, throughout the body and your kidneys, and, you, and your body produces um, active form of vitamin D. Um, but it's the vitamin D supplementation where there's um, some controversy, especially within the... Um, orthopedic world and uh, bone fractures and bone health Um, and so you know we recommend vitamin d for boosting immunity and for other things so it'll be interesting how the research plays out but um but everyone ideally you know just being out in nature there's so many benefits um in addition to getting your vitamin d but just being active not sitting in front of your computer um kind of just playing a little bit i think that's probably one of the greatest um pieces of preventative medicine for any issue is getting outside and doing something for 5, 10, 15 minutes that you actually enjoy doing, just taking a breath and walking away from, like, the chaos that's, like, your day-to-day operations, you know. That that is your day. Yes, absolutely. And thanks for clarifying that's the oral. But I think that for a lot of people, they're like, oh, I'll just take vitamin D. I don't need to be outside. I get that from a lot of people. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So... Dr. Kara said it, and you've heard me say it a thousand times over and over again. You got to yeah. get outside. Got to get outside. You got to do it. Yeah. So we've talked about how you need to sleep. We've yeah. talked about how you need to get naked. We've <laughs> talked about we've talked about making sure that you poop and drink water. I mean, we've talked about all kinds of different things related to skincare here. But really, the most important thing that I am going to definitely take away from this is how many connections sleep has to your skin health because I didn't really think about that prior to this. I thought a lot about hydration. I thought a mm-hmm. lot about making sure your digestive system's on point, mm-hmm. a lot about all those different things, but I didn't think 100% on that connection to sleep. And so I highly recommend that all of you out there spend some time focusing on what's going on in your bedroom, mm-hmm. getting away from the screens a little bit, and really focus on each other too because, shoot, I mean, now we know that we can set a date. That's right. A hot, a hot date a for hot at least date. <laughs> maybe <laughs> twice a month because we both have different birthdays. That's and so, true. yeah, see, you got two hot dates right there with your right. significant other where you can check out your skin and you're not on the screens and then you can go right to bed and it'll be nice and cozy and fun. And I'm going to take all of the notes that Dr. Kira noted here, like the chili pad, flux.com, the blue blocking glasses, and I'm going to take all of that information and put it into my podcast notes at drjkrausnd.com for your future reference. I will also create a blog post, which is kind of my way of doing a transcript 
of <laughs> um, this podcast as well. So check out that later on. And you can find everything at drjkrausnd.com. So, Dr. Kara, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. I look forward to geeking out with you <laughs> at some time here soon so we can do another one of these. Sounds great. All right, everybody. Have a great day, whatever you're doing. If you're looking for a new approach to your skincare and overall health, you can find Dr. Barr online at chooseresilience.com. With her extensive background in skin cancer, I highly recommend anyone who has a history of skin cancer to reach out to her as she's a wealth of knowledge. In fact, we chatted so much on this podcast, we ran out of time and I need to have her back to talk about amazing skincare products for helping keep your skin healthy and preventing cancer at the same time. So stay tuned for our next podcast. Might be in a couple ones from now when I can get her back after she's out doing a lot of her speaking engagements, but I will have her back, so stay tuned for that. You've survived another episode of The Health Fix. Hey everybody, Dr. Janine Krause here. If you liked what you heard today, then head over to drjkrausnd.com to find my free resources and information to know when I post something new that's juicy that you might want to check out. Plus, head over to where you get your podcasts and like, subscribe, and write a review to help get the word out about me and help others at the same time to find me. It really does help, and I really appreciate all of your reviews.